so kind. You can, you can take a seat. My goodness. Um, now that all that has been said, prepare for disappointment. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I am so beyond honored to be here today. And if I can just take a moment before we get into this message uh, to just say thank you to and honor your lead pastors. Uh, Pastor Sam, I know Pastor Jess is watching online this morning. I hope that you don't take for granted the leadership that this church has and that you have. Um, because these people, yeah, come on. They, like, don't come around that often. Sam and Jess are, are truly legendary. Um, I can speak in authenticity when I say our church would not be what it is without Pastor Sam and Jess and without C3 Toronto. Um, you guys have been an inspiration to us from afar. In fact, before we ever launched the church, I brought some of our team up here because I said, look at C3 Toronto. This is the kind of church that we want to be like. And um, before we ever started, we were learning from you guys, stealing all of your stuff. Like our next steps course is completely stolen from, from C3 Toronto. In fact, there's been times where we've caught typos where it's like, when you join the team at, and it doesn't say cross and anchor, it says C3 in there still. And then we were like, oh, shoot, we got to change that. Um, but, but you guys just have tremendous leaders. They have such generous hearts. They're just always looking for a way to bless somebody and, and a way to be there for someone and to give to someone. And um, that just kind of bleeds through this entire church. Um, you can just see it in the team and you can see it as you walk through the doors. And we are just the biggest fans of C3 Toronto and of Pastor Sam and Jess. So one more time, can we just say thank you to them for stepping out in faith and planting this church nearly 10 years ago. That's incredible. Um, I am so excited to preach this morning. I've got a word on my heart. Uh, I'm gonna jump into the series that you guys are, have been going through called Renew. And I love the idea of this series, which is that we're gonna challenge our thinking because the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. And if we can change our thinking, Pastor Sam mentioned this earlier, then we can change our life. If you change the way you think, you will change the way that you live. Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And oftentimes we don't think about what we think about. Did you know that research has shown that nearly 80% of our self-talk is negative? And we wonder why our life is moving in a negative direction when we don't challenge the way we think. So I'm excited to share this morning about this thought. What do you think about or what do you think of when you think about your future? What do you think of when you think of your future? And especially after the last couple of years and everything that we've been through, you know, it seems like the entire world has been through trauma, going through, you know, epidemic, wars, uh, dealing with all sorts of natural disasters and, and problems and, and what we've gone through personally and what we've gone through in our cities, what we've gone through in our churches, sometimes we are tempted to believe that the best is behind us. And that is the lie of the enemy about our future, is that the best is behind us. Because if we aren't careful, we'll, we'll be thinking about our future in terms of disbelief, in terms of doubt, even in terms of dread, being scared about what lies around the corner, instead of being confident and filled with expectation and filled with faith for what God is going to do. So I've titled this morning's message, Fear is Not My Future. Fear is Not My Future. Why don't you turn to somebody that you're sitting next to and say, fear is not your future. We don't have to be filled with fear. We can be filled with faith. I'd like us to look at the book of Ezra today. Yeah, let's go. Come on. We're getting all Old Testament up in here, y'all. Ezra, chapter 3, verse 10. Is this going to come up on the screen? I have it here, but I'm just... Wanted to make sure. Okay, cool. Let's read this. 
When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets, and the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord. I'm assuming is what the next word is. <laughs> just as King David, he's a person to praise, right? <laughs> to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. Let's keep going. We're going to go to verse 13. It says, with praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout. <laughs> praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. I just want to say that again. The foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. Let's go to the next verse. But many of the older priests, Levites and other leaders who had seen the first temple, wept aloud when they saw the new temple. We're going to continue going. We're almost done. Wept aloud when they saw the new. Okay. Oh, so I guess I'll just finish reading it for you. It's all good. Still many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping. Because the people were making so much noise and the sound was heard from afar. Can we pray as we continue this morning? God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it speaks to us today, right here, right now, where we're at, despite the fact that it was written thousands of years ago. God, you have something from this that you want us to learn on this beautiful morning of May 15th. We pray, God, that our hearts would be open to receive it and that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Just to give you a little context for what's happening here in the book of Ezra, is that the temple, Solomon's temple, which was like probably one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was so beautiful. It was magnificent. Solomon was incredibly wealthy and rich. He hired the best architects, designers, craftsmen of his day to assemble this incredible temple for God. And it stood in Israel for a long period of time. And then Israel, after Lots and lots of running and disobeying and refusing to do what God had told them to do ended up having to be taken to a land of captivity and their temple was destroyed. Fast forward and now the Israelites are returning back to their homeland and they're rebuilding what was once destroyed. Does this sound familiar? I believe this is the state of the church right now. We're coming back to the temple of God. We're rebuilding what has maybe fallen down in some cases or been destroyed. I know in our lives, sometimes we're looking at ruins spiritually because we've been living disconnected from God, disconnected from his people. Our spiritual lives are in decay and they're not anything like their former glory. And so we're in this era where we're coming back and we're rebuilding. Some of us are like coming out of the dark, like rubbing our eyes, awaking from our spiritual slumber. We've spent the past two years watching Netflix and hanging out on Zoom calls and, and like watching people live stream everything, their, their DJ sets. I'm sure we've got a lot of DJs here, like live streaming to all of your fans. You know, there's, there's people like live streaming their work. You're li everything is live stream now. And we're coming out of this back into the house of God, But one group in this story, one group of people saw this and was weeping, and another group of people saw this and was rejoicing. Isn't it interesting how two sets of people can look at the exact same thing and come out with a completely different conclusion? If you need a proof in, in point, I, I was not sure if I would say this or not. It might be too soon, but the Maple Leafs and the Tampa Bay Lightning... <laughs> Two groups of people looking at the exact same outcome. One of them so depressed they barely made it to church this morning. And the people in Tampa Bay, man, Tampa Bay, come on. Do they need another championship team? Do they need, come on, Tom Brady's down there. What is so great about Tampa Bay? Like I'd much rather, I'd much rather be in Toronto than Tampa Bay. Anyway, two groups of people looking at the exact same situation but feeling completely different about it. Why? Because of where each of those people had placed their hope. 
What you believe and where your hope is will determine how you feel about the outcome of the things happening in your life. One group of people will look at something and they'll be ecstatic, they'll be exuberant, they'll be leaping for joy because they're seeing the beginning of God doing something incredible, while another group of people sees the same thing and says, it's not good enough. It should be better. It should be bigger. It's nothing like what it used to be. And this is what I want to tell you this morning, is that sometimes your sight can get in the way of your vision. Sometimes your sight can get in the way of your vision. It's been said that visibility, I think Mike Todd said this, visibility is what you see with your eyes open, and vision is what you see with your eyes closed. And some of us, based on what we're seeing in the physical, in our current state, are coming to a conclusion that isn't actually true because our sight has got in the way of our vision. You see, the older generation who saw the foundation of the temple being laid, all they could see was a foundation. But the, the young people who were rejoicing, they saw possibility. They saw a future. They were ecstatic that God was doing something again. But the older generation wasn't satisfied with it. And if you want to know where God sides on this, he's much more in that younger generation camp. Because the book of Zechariah, it says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Because the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. God loves to see new things starting. God loves to see where things could go. God is a God of potential. God doesn't see things where they are. He sees things where they're going. He doesn't measure something by what it's doing right now, but by the trajectory that it's heading in. That's why God's not concerned so much about size. He says that faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. So God is excited about potential. But some of us will see a foundation and that's all we'll see. But God doesn't see a foundation, God sees a building. God doesn't see a foundation, God sees a future. And so I ask again, what do you think about when you think about your future? A lot of us are letting what we think about the future be informed by what we're seeing in the present. And you can't come to a conclusion about your future solely based on what you're seeing in the present. Some of us will write things off, we'll dismiss things, we won't become a part of things because we can't see the potential of those things. Have you heard of this guy, Ronald Wayne? There's a reason. Have you heard of a guy named Steve Jobs? Okay. So, nope. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, co-founders of Apple. The third member of the co-founding group was Ronald Wayne. He worked for Apple for 12 days. He saw Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak working out of a garage. He was in his 40s. They were in their 20s. He thought, this is not going to go well. There's not potential here. And 12 days after becoming the third person to found Apple, he sold all of his shares back to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak for $800. It was 10% of Apple. That 10%... In 2018, from the time I read about this, that 10% in 2018 would have been worth more than $95 billion. And that kind of money would have made Ronald Wayne one of the richest people in the world. Some of us, we can't see the potential. We can't see the future. All we're seeing is what this foundation looks like in the present, and we're writing it off when God has something incredible that he wants to do. And if you would just stay committed, and if you would just stay put, and if you would be faithful, and if you would build, and if you would commit, and if you would continue to move forward in faith, you would see God do the impossible. So don't think about your future just based on what you see in the present. But it wasn't just the present that was making this one group of people mourn. It was also what they had seen in the past. Because they had seen the old temple. And so they had something to compare what they were seeing now to what they had seen in the past. I've heard it said that comparison is the quickest way to kill something special. 
If you want to kill something special, just start to compare it to something else. And some of us, we're not happy about what God is doing in our life because we're spending our life thinking about a place where we used to be and we're thinking about all the things that we've lost and we're not thinking about what God is doing in this moment right now. And I wanna challenge you today to quit thinking about the future by comparing it to the past. Because God is doing a new thing. God wants to do something that he's never done before. God wants to do something that you've never seen before. God wants to do something so powerful that it will blow your mind, but you're never gonna be able to fully walk into it if you're living thinking about your past all the time. It's easy for us as a church right now, I'm talking about our church in Detroit, to spend all of our time thinking about what things were like before the pandemic. I mean, we had seen God do incredible things. Our church was growing. We had two services, morning and evening. We moved from our first location to a second location that was much bigger, and it was this cool old Catholic cathedral kind of close to downtown in Detroit, and people loved it, and we had big plans for it, and the pandemic hit. We probably lost 50% of our people. We went through trial after trial. We we felt like we could never get back to where things were. At times, we, we lost the building we were meeting in and it took us a long time to find a new place we could meet. And I have to confess to you that I've spent a lot of time in these last couple years thinking about what was instead of thinking about what is. And now that I look with fresh eyes on what God is doing in our church, and, and maybe this is a word for you as, as a church as well, is I don't just see what I saw in the past. When I see this foundation, what I see with the people that are there is the foundation of a new beautiful thing that God is building. We've, we've planted our church twice now. I've seen a foundation one time and now I'm seeing another foundation. And so I brought our team, our, our team members into a meeting the other week and I was like, hey, you know, everything that's happened in the past, we praise God for, we're, we're thankful for, but you in this room are the foundation of the new thing that God is building. And what if we could all in this room today think we're the foundation of a, of a new thing that God is building. Can you imagine what God could do with this foundation? I mean, most of the churches around Canada and in America would kill to have this as a foundation. But you guys have experience, you guys have longevity in this city, you guys have amazing leaders, you guys have, oh my goodness, I, I just am filled with excitement, not just about what God's done, but about what God is going to do through C3 Toronto. And I, I'm thankful to get to be here for it. So how do you stop living in your past? I wanna just take us to one more verse. Isaiah 43, starting in verse 18. You've probably heard these words before. Let's start in verse 18. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. Let's read the next verse. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Don't you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness and I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. It's funny because if you get the context of what's happening here, I want us to jump up just a couple more verses so you understand what he's saying this about. Let's go to verse 16. It says, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. Verse 17. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. He's referring back to Israel's biggest moment of all time. When they were let out of Egypt and God freed them from their slavery and when they became a nation. And this is something so monu monumental and huge that God actually instituted a holiday for them to remember this. It's called Passover. And every year the Jewish people would remember what God did during this time and how he passed over their land and how he led them out. And they would eat unleavened bread during the Passover because it would remind them that they had to leave Egypt so quickly. They didn't even have time to bake their bread. And they would do this with their kids so that their kids would remember what God has done. And God spends like so much time in the Old Testament referring back to this moment. But then he says, forget it. 
I don't want you to remember this anymore. When your past becomes a hurdle that you have to jump over instead of a catapult to jolt you forward into your future is when you need to forget it. You need to say that was great with what God did back then, but God is doing something new right now. God is doing something incredible right now. The Hebrew word, the Hebrew word where it says I'm doing a new thing, it's the same word that God uses when it says that he created the heavens and the earth. That's the power that he is doing a new thing with. That's the creative force that he is doing a new thing in your life with. With the same kind of excitement and ingenuity and creativity that he created the earth with. Behold, I am doing a new thing. And then he says, don't you perceive it? Can't you see it? Like, have you ever gone looking for a car? Maybe not here in Toronto. I don't know. Your public transportation is way better than ours in Detroit. We just use buses. That's all we've got. And a little queue line. It goes from like, it goes two miles up and down the downtown area. But when you start looking for a car, if you've ever been shopping for one, all of a sudden, everywhere you look on the street, you start seeing. You're like, oh, there's Hyundai Elantras everywhere. There's Nissan Versas everywhere. Like, oh my gosh, I, oh, it comes in green. It's in black. Were those cars not there before? They were. You just weren't looking for it. God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? It's all around you. You just have to open up your eyes to it. But sometimes we live without receiving the new thing God's doing because we're comparing it to the past. We're like Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite living our glory days about our college football career when God has something great he wants to do not back then but today, right now. And, and we don't receive it sometimes too because we don't like the package that it comes in. Have... I sent these pictures. I don't know if, if they made it into the pro presenter, but there's two pictures that I wanted to show you if I could. Before we launched our church, we ordered a neon sign. Nope, it's not there. Okay, well, I'll describe it to you. It's my fault. I didn't send it till this morning. But there was a neon sign that we hang up at our church. We still have it today. It's, it's really cool. A friend of mine was able to make it for us before we launched. And when it arrived at my house, he shipped it to us from Montana. And when it arrived at my house... I had no idea what it was. It literally looked like, like an assault rifle or like a sniper rifle or something. It was like this really long package, and it looked like it had like a handle on it. And I was like, I'm surprised that the delivery guy even delivered this. Like, he's probably like, what, what is this? And I didn't, I was at first, I'm like, what is that? And it would have been real easy for me to just be like, That's, I didn't order that, and just send it back. But then when I opened it, it was this beautiful custom design neon sign for our church. And I think that the new thing God wants to do in our lives, sometimes it arrives at our doorstep and it doesn't look, it doesn't come in the package that we thought it would come in. And so we're tempted to just send it back. Instead of if we would get past the packaging, we would see the promise that's inside. And that God has something incredible if we would just step in and maybe try something different and try something new and just trust him. God wants to do a new thing. So we just have to be careful not to let our sight damage our vision. And I just want to pull out a couple more points from this, and then we'll go on to the next thing. But in verse 19, can we pull that up one more time? In verse 19, it, it says this, talking about ways in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God says, behold, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to make rivers in the desert. He's saying, I'm going to do a new thing. And if you aren't familiar with this part of the story, Israel, what they did when they remembered what God had done for them, letting them out of Egypt, is that they kind of like sugarcoated that whole experience. Because right after God led them through the Red Sea, killed all the Egyptians, they walked on dry ground to the other side, right after that or close after that, they ended up disbelieving God and instead of walking into the promised land, they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. Isn't it interesting how we romanticize our past? And we selectively remember the things about it that we think were good. 
You ever break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Or they broke up with you? And then all, all that you can remember is the great times that you had. Oh, I remember when we did this, I remember when we did, oh, forget all the fights, forget the fact that we were never on the same page, forget the fact that I so, like, was so angry with them like half the time, and we don't remember any of that stuff. And Israel was doing that in this moment. Is there like, oh God, look what God did, look what God did. Well, you know what? They never got to where they were going. They got stuck, and most of them never made it to the promised land. Listen, you think the past is better than it actually is. And God's saying, I'm going to do a new thing, and this time, you're not going to get stuck. This time, you're going to make it through the wilderness. I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to bring up rivers in the desert. I don't know if you know much about deserts. I don't. I'm not a desertologist, but I do know that water and deserts don't really go together. If there's water in a desert, it's not a desert anymore. It's an oasis. Water doesn't flow in the desert. It's dry, and it's... It's hot and, and you can't get anything to quench your thirst. And so God's saying, not only am I going to make a way in the wilderness so you're not going to get stuck, but I'm going to bring water into a dry place. I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to do something impossible that you could have never seen in the past. And I want to do it in the future. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I felt led to, to bring this message to you guys today because I just know that God wants to do a new thing. He wants to do a new thing. He's really big into new things. Anybody remember DC Talk? It's like 10 people. Yeah. You remember DC Talk? You know, he's doing it. God is doing a new, and it was N-U-T-H-A-N-G, new thing. One of the best songs of all time. You need to go back and listen to that after church. But God loves to do new things. He's not like up in heaven replaying his greatest hits. I used to live with a friend who loved U2. And I, I like U2. I also like DC Talk, okay? Get over it. That's who I am. And I'm not apologizing. But I, I would listen to U2 a lot. But my friend, every morning on his boom box in, in my like five, five people shared this house in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he would put on U2 and he would play the same songs all the time. And as much as I love U2, I never wanted to hear them again after I spent some time in that house. I, I just can't stand like, you know, repetition and repetition and repetition. I have to have some variety. I have to see something new. I, I can't just be stuck in the same pattern over and over and over again. And God's kind of like that. God's not just like, hey, remember when I fed the 5,000? Whew, let's replay. <laughs> hey, check this out. Remember when, I, remember when I, uh, I did the miracle, Lazarus was in the grave, and then he rose up? Yeah, check this out. Watch it again. <laughs> God, if you just get stuck reading about what God did in the Bible, but not experiencing what God wants to do in your life, then you're missing the new thing that he wants to do. So I wanna challenge you this morning. God wants to do a new thing. If you will walk into it, fear does not have to be your future. Your future can be filled with faith and with hope. And really what this passage is talking about is when God creates new life inside of us. Our hearts are dry wastelands without Jesus. But he comes in with his river of living water and he satisfies our deepest desires and he gives us a new beginning and a fresh start and he makes a way for us in the wilderness and he doesn't leave us stranded in our sin because how many know that sometimes you can get liberated from Egypt but you can still be living in your past and God says, no, I'm not just gonna take you out, I'm gonna bring you to the promised land. God has a promised land he wants to take you to, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And if that sounds weird to you, I get it, because I don't totally understand that either. It's kind of an old agricultural reference. When I think about a great place I want to go, I'm like, does it have milk and honey? <laughs> hey, let's go, let's go to French Polynesia. Ooh, wonderful. It's milk and honey, right? <laughs> but it just meant it was a land of abundance. 
It was a land that everything they needed would be provided for. It was a land of delicacy. It was a land of beauty. And God wants to take you from the dry desert. And he wants to bring you to the promised land. And where that journey starts is by God doing a new thing in you by giving you a fresh start through Jesus. Maybe you came to church today and maybe you haven't been to church in a long time or maybe you just are checking this out. You're trying to like get back out into public again and hanging out. Maybe a friend invited you or maybe you even grew up going to church or being around stuff like this, but you have not yet begun this new start with Jesus. Today is your day. Today is the day of salvation for you. Today is a day where you can truly leave your past behind because God wants to write a new story and he is the author of new life that he wants to bring to you today. And by what he did 2,000 years ago, coming to earth and becoming a human to relate with us and to show us what, that he knows what it's like to be one of us. That's what makes Christianity different than every other religion. Every other religion makes you try to work your way towards God. But in Christianity, God worked his way to us. He actually became one of us. Like what other God would humble himself to the point of becoming one of his servants, one of his creation? But God did that through the person of Jesus. And he did it thinking about you. He lived the life that you and I could never live so that we could live the kind of life that he has for us. And so if you want that life that's available to you through Jesus Christ, I'm just gonna give, as we close this time today, an opportunity for you to do that. Can we pray together? God, thank you for your presence in this room. Thank you for this incredible church that is making such a difference in this city. God, thank you for those watching in Hamilton. Thank you for those watching online. Thank you, God, that through C3 Toronto, you are showing a city what it can look like when it's connected to the source of life. And God, I pray for anyone here today who does not yet have that life-giving relationship with you that's changed them from the inside out. Maybe they thought they had to work to get your favor. Maybe they thought they had to earn their good standing with you. Would you show them today it's only because of grace? It's only because of grace and what Jesus did that we can have a, a new beginning with you. And would you show them how much you love them? You love them to the point that you would die for them. There is no greater love than that. And while we're praying in this moment, if you would like to make a commitment to Jesus today and say, I want him in my life, I want to invite him in to make my desert into a garden teeming with life, then I just want you, I'm gonna to count to three and I just want you to raise your hand to signify that. This is you saying, I want the life of Jesus inside of me. One, God loves you and he brought you here today for a reason. Two, no one in here is an accident. Three, raise your hand if you would like to make that commitment to Jesus today. This is awesome. Hands going up all over the place. Don't be ashamed. This is your new start. This is your new beginning. This is the new thing that God wants to do in you. You can put your hands down. If that's you today, I want you to just say this prayer in your heart to God right now. I want you to say this, dear God, I give my life to you. I turn from my sin. I turn to you as my savior. Come into me and make me new. You're my Lord and you're my savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate those giving their lives to Jesus today? Come on.